Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your boy, Gerald. We got a little bit different of a video today. We had an amazing community member named Vrosh reach out and ask to review a DevOps platform engineering uh, roadmap that he had created, essentially a set of skills that he had identified as what you need to kind of become a platform engineer, a DevOps professional. And I'm going to go ahead and react to that. I, I kind of work with him and reacted to it before, and this is actually version two of this, which I think is awesome, but we wanted everyone to be able to benefit from this, which is great. Frosh has been awesome. He helped create the Discord. Link will be down in the description. If you're interested in being part of a community around platform engineering and DevOps, please go ahead and join. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump into it. Now, let's look at this key here, right, that he has at the top, DevOps Roadmap 2022. And the color key seems to be must do, optional is yellow, must do green, blue is tools and tech. So what I'm gonna try and do, because I think a lot of these skills will be applicable, is to hopefully help with the prioritization, like what's most important, things like that, All right? So let's go ahead and jump in. Now, at the top, we'll start at the top, programming languages, uh, with a focus on automation and scripting, bash and python and bash seems to be this blue and green tools and tech and must do python a pure programming language and in this development category he has around golang i think in the platform engineering and devops space this makes sense bash is still very widely used in all organizations that you'll be a part of and so you'll need to learn it right you'll need to learn it sometimes you'll need to update bash scripts a lot of times pipelines are calling bash scripts or python scripts right knowing either or both of these languages is really important bash will help you too with just day-to-day -day stuff navigating servers things like that so i personally use bash probably daily right at least basic commands and then whenever i get to the point where i'm scripting honestly nowadays it's usually in golang uh, if I'm building a script that needs to do something repeatable, I use Golang instead of something like Python. No hit on Python or Node.js, anything like that. You can get by and use those for platform engineering. But Go allows me to build for these multiple OSs right out the gate. Uh, I like the flow of it. I like that it's a compiled language. I like the type system. And it's used in a lot of open source projects and platform engineering related projects as well. Solid language overall, right? So I think from a prioritization standpoint, probably you would wanna pick up a language like Python first, if you're coming from a place where you don't know anything. A language like Python or Node.js, JavaScript, will help you get pretty far. You can do a lot of things, a lot of platform engineering things. Surprisingly, there is a lot of Node.js stuff that's uh, platform engineering oriented, even though I think probably a language like Golang would be better suited for it, personally, my personal opinion. But I just start with the language uh, start learning how to automate some specific things in language like Python, and then, you know, learn Bash along the way. You'll need to know it. It's one of those things you'll need to know, knowing not just the commands, but how to string them together, how to do some basic logic, how to handle variables, things like that. Uh, in Bash will help you, right? How to even handle input, use input. If you want to make little scripts here and there to do uh, quick things and you don't feel like busting out a language like Go or Python or Node.js, then that makes sense but i prioritize a language like python or go up front and then go and learn bash and parallelize you go along right i'm biased so i'm leaning go all the way that's just me i've, I've written a lot in these other languages python actually not as much i've written more in node.js i've written a good amount in python but go is just kind of taking the cake for me as far as languages go with the types of things that i do day to day, right? Let's jump down to OS concepts. We have Linux and Windows. Honestly, if you plan on going the Windows route, right, like learning.net, learning the Windows way of doing things, Windows server admin, stuff like that, then sure, learn Windows if that's the career path you wanna do. But from a platform engineering and DevOps perspective, Linux is gonna be king here, right? You really wanna learn Linux, you want to learn, you know, server management, the basics of it, right? And you could start with something like Ubuntu. It's pretty simple. You can mess around with certain distros depending on how interested you are. 
But learning the fundamentals of how Linux operates is going to be pretty key. And he has these concepts, OS concepts, that are listed here. Interesting thing is, I'll just kind of go in order. Uh, I.O. management, yes, you need to learn that. Virtualization, that's huge. You need to learn that for sure. You need to know the basics of memory and storage management just from the perspective of, hey, I have these applications or processes running. How much are they consuming? making sure that you're aware of how much that consumption is. You need to know the basics of file systems, process management, basics, but you, you can dive really deep on, into these things. And that's really what I'm trying to caution against. With process management, you can dive really deep. You wanna know contextually how to find your app in a process list, how to see how many resources it's consuming, right? And then those concepts build on themselves. And you can go as deep as you need, depending upon what you're actually trying to do. Memory and storage, the same thing, right? Virtualization, you just see a lot of all the time. You need to know kind of the fundamentals of that for sure. Networking concepts, for sure. I think he has a whole section, uh, if I'm not confused, maybe on that. But networking concepts, yes, you need to know uh, different interfaces and how they work at a high level, right? But you can learn that as you go as well. There are certain things around networking that you really need to know around like TCP, HTTP, things like that. But that's not really networking concepts as much at the OS level. That's more so the interconnectivity of applications and services. Anyway, uh, service management, need to know the basics about that. You're gonna do that all the time, especially in Linux. You're gonna be using systemd a lot. You're gonna be using initd. Um, these I would put in a similar category that you're often talked about in the same way but he, he separated them as service management and startup management, which, okay, that's fine, that makes sense. And then advanced subjects, threads and concurrency, yep, you're gonna need to know a bit about that, but learn as you go, again, learn as you go. Sockets, yeah, POSIX basics, yeah. Out of all of these, if I had to choose, hey, which ones do I focus on first? I would choose virtualization, that would probably be first. I would choose um, service management. For sure, if I had to just choose three, virtual virtualization, service management, and file systems, I think. Because you're, you're just going <laughs> to, you have to work with the file system so much, right? Uh, and you'll be scripting a lot of things around the file system. So learning those three things will, will help a lot. Then probably I'll do I.O., then process management, um, and networking concepts and memory and storage, I would learn the high level of those at least, right? But hopefully that helps at least from a prioritization standpoint. Sockets, if you're building like a socket-based web application or something, you'll you'll learn that as you go as well. Uh, so there's that. Uh, POSIX, compliance, things like that. That's, that's fine too. You'll kind of learn that as you go as well. All right, so Linux administration. He has a whole thing now on this, which this is the first time I'm seeing this is pretty cool. CLI, user and file management, SSH. Yep, those are things you're gonna have to do a lot all the time. So I definitely focus on that. Processes, kill and start. Yep, that's, that's about as much you want to do. This is some of the stuff from our discussion I see he worked in here. Text editors, any of these are fine. I'm biased again towards Vim. That's what I use as my daily driver and I enjoy it. And I think it gives me a lot of power, especially as I'm interacting with servers and having to SSH into things and just in general with my development workflow. Uh, learn to live in the terminal. I like that principle. I think that's part of the power of VI and Vim or any of these uh, kind of command line based editors because it lends itself to learning scripting and to learning bash and learning these different things. It just exposes you to that world, if that makes sense. Hopefully someone in the comments, if they get what I'm saying, they can explain it as well, but it exposes you to the world of having to build out these things and having to learn these concepts of what happens in the terminal terminal around bash, etc. And then down here, he lists Vim again in this list with bash, ZSH, ZSH is cool, uh, Nano, PowerShell, Emacs, those are kind of put in this similar category of what I just said. Text manipulation tools. Okay, you can really go down a rabbit hole with this. And I mean, I think this stuff is fun. But if you're new, and you're just trying to learn, I think up front, if you if you even learn cat and echo, you can get by a long time with cat and echo <laughs> alone. 
the you know being able to cat out a file and just see what's in it in your terminal and you know pipe that to something like xcopy or something like that that'll that'll get you pretty far as well as uh, echo i would honestly probably add i don't see them on here i would add like tail and things like that here just as you're like it helps you with monitoring log files and things like that uh which is pretty good i would add that stuff in here networking all this stuff is good i mean you can get by a while though on ping if you learn mmap you can dive deep on mmap but you don't need to right you can get by on ping you can get by on um i think it's if config or you know i use lsoft for a lot of for a lot of stuff like if i want to see if certain things are running on certain ports but that's this process monitoring he has down here but honestly if, if you just need to ping and make sure that traffic is able to be uh, is, is running at a certain address that's easy and then mmap is cool oh, all of these are good tools. I'm not, don't get me wrong, but a lot of the stuff, if you're working in platform engineering, you're going to be working with cloud and you're not usually going to be like using IT, IP tables as much, but it's still a thing. Prioritization though, you can get by on ping, you can get by on cat and echo. I would also add recursive search to this recursive search control R is really helpful. Uh, PS all the time. I use PS for process monitoring. Uh, HTOP I use a lot rather than top. They're both kind of in the same category, but HTOP gives you some more information. Else off, I already mentioned that. System performance. Day-to-day, -day, honestly, I don't use much of these day-to-day. -day. Um, I In the cloud environment, I have monitoring and things set up around my hardware resources that tells me kind of how the system is performing, if it's under too much load, etc. So I don't usually have to go in and figure this stuff out myself as much compiling source code make is a good automation tool it's not my favorite good like kind of build automation tool it's fine it's just not my favorite i don't really like it gcc yeah especially if you're writing you know kind of c c plus plus things like that uh if you're writing go you know you know they, they abstract a lot of that stuff so you can still use make i know people that use make it's not my favorite but no hate there others uh yeah history honestly i'll probably put higher than this i use history a lot especially when i wasn't doing recursive search i would like do you know history pipe grep and then look for a certain command that i had run and that was something i used pretty often before i started using recursive search with control r wireless and networking communication lan wan devices switch router eyes as a platform engineer, honestly, you don't need to know as much about this. You need to know the concepts, but you don't need to know as much of like switches and routers. And you need to know about IP addresses. You need to know about subnetting for sure. Uh, you're doing a lot of that in the cloud. You're building these virtual networks and configuring how they work together. You need to know a bit about DNS for sure. I would say that subnetting DNS and IP addresses, you need to understand that stuff. Under this model category, he has TCP IP, the OSI model. Yes, I would start there, honestly. I would start with understanding the OSI model, the different layers, and then dive in each into each one particularly, right? TCP IP, you need to understand that. HTTP, you need to understand that. Uh, when you understand HTTP and HTTPS, that'll lend itself also to understanding SSL and TLS. FTP, sure. I don't use it as often nowadays. Port forwarding, sure, I use it sometimes. SSH, yeah, I still use that all the time. So that's gonna be a thing. Uh, what is how to reverse proxy, forward proxy, caching server load balancer, yep. And he has tools in here, like Nginx, yep. Apache, Tomcat, need to understand a bit about firewalls. This will be huge around load balancing, especially if you're doing like kind of traditional web applications and building your old load balancing. Uh, once you get into kind of service mesh and things like that, these tools become a little less relevant, but it's still a thing you need to understand because it's we're, we're not out of the web server load balancing space yet by any means. So yeah, reverse proxies, use that a ton. Nginx, I lean towards Nginx myself. That's just what I end up using a lot of the time. Git and GitHub, 100%. I would honestly love this to be higher on the list. Like right under Linux administration, the third row down, 
I would love to see Git and GitHub because as a platform engineer, you need to apply software engineering principles as you build this automation. And that includes Git. You need to understand how to work with others, how to commit your code at regular set intervals so that you're keeping track of your code as it grows, right? This gives you a ton of freedom, a ton of flexibility, right? You, of course, you need to know the basics. You need to know how to commit. You need to know how to push. You need to know the difference between a public and private repository. You need to know how to fork. Uh, maybe learn the other ones first, but forking, that just kind of happens. Pull, of course. Clone, of course. Pull request, yes. Especially if you were on a team, you need to know how to do pull requests. Uh, creating repositories, of course. Branching, yes, you should understand too the different types of branches that the organization you're working with, what do they like to do? Are they creating feature branches? What kind of naming conventions do they have? Each one's going to be a little bit different, blah, blah, blah. Rebase, yeah, that uh, come into handy, uh, come in handy for sure. Learning YAML. You, you can't really be in a platform engineering space and not know a bit of YAML. You, you have to. I'm biased again because I work at HashiCorp and I use HCL for the majority of these things, but I still can't get away from YAML completely. You're doing Kubernetes stuff. You're going to be doing some YAML stuff uh, or Docker stuff. You're going to be doing some YAML stuff. So that's fine. I'm, I'm cool with this for sure. I, I would add HCL here just because I'm like, I would put this as domain languages maybe. Instead of just saying YAML, I would say configuration languages or like DSL, domain specific languages, and put YAML here and put HCL here. And there's maybe a couple others that are relevant, like, you know, uh, Toml, things like that. Anyway, cloud providers. Let's go to the next one. Basic concepts. Yep. Compute storage, network design patterns, identity and access. Uh, and I would even start to separate these into understanding what is from the cloud providers perspective, their infrastructure as a service offerings, what are their platform as a service offerings versus what kind of we talk about as platform engineering and what is their software as a service type offerings as well. And there's other stuff in between, but those are kind of the three core ones that I'll make sure about identity and access. Yep. Need to, understand that that's going to be core to everything how all of your cloud resources interact so no matter what the cloud provider is you need to understand their identity and access management model which is usually i am i know for aws gcp it's i am and then you need to understand a bit about active directory with azure digital ocean kind of its own thing i like digital ocean more so for personal stuff but the big three uh, if i if i had to just speak on prioritization I would definitely go the big three. And if I had to choose in the big three, look at jobs in your area, like go to Dice or Indeed or whatever it is, the job site, type in AWS engineer, cloud engineer with AWS in the title, uh, cloud architect, whatever it is, and search and just see how many jobs they're looking for in your local area, even though a lot of them are remote, so it's, it's not as big of a deal. But that should give you idea of the demand, right? And then prioritize based on the demand because we're talking about practicality here, what it takes to get jobs. Uh, AWS is still everywhere. Azure is at a lot of places, a lot of places. Uh, GCP coming up too at a lot of places. So you can't really go wrong, I don't think. I worked a lot with AWS and then I chose to get a GCP shirt because I like it. I work a lot with Azure and AWS and GCP now just being at a multi-cloud company, right? Deployment models, yep, need to understand a bit about that. Public, private, hybrid. Oh, and he does have the service models here. Platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, software as a service. That makes sense. Those basic concepts will kind of roll under some of those as well. Um, cool. I think that's good. Hopefully that helps from a prioritization standpoint. Virtualization and containers. Need to understand VMs. He has OCI here, CRI here. The, okay. Uh, container technology. Yep. You're going to have to understand that. You need to understand VMs. If you go with Docker, that's fine too. There's a lot of other ones, right? A lot of other ones, but Docker, I do agree that should probably be prioritized here. It's still the most common that you see the most often, right? So Docker and VMs and understanding the difference between the two. 
that's good to know. Uh, working with them, actually getting some experience building some images, some container images. Uh, you can use tools like Packer to build VM images if you need to. And learning how the flow of managing those images and building them into artifacts and deploying them to uh, different orchestrators, that's, that's a very valuable exercise and critical to understand as a platform engineer. Advanced Docker, security, best practice, scanning. I think security should definitely be at the heart of everything you're learning. Try and ask yourself, okay, how, what are the secure practices around this specific thing I'm, I'm learning? What are the secure practices around VMs? What are the secure practices around containers? How does each cloud provider approach security? What are they thinking? Because as a platform slash DevOps professional, it's your job, especially, it's everyone's job, but it's your job, especially to think about how we bake in security to everything that we do. Uh, Kubernetes, yep, got to learn a bit about Kubernetes <laughs> if you want to be in this space right now. Kubernetes is everywhere. Uh, all of these, really, you should probably learn. That. Get, get the fundamentals, deploy an app to a cluster, you know, learn basics of administration, all that good stuff, for sure. CI, CD, yep, pipelines are going to be everywhere as well in the platform engineering and DevOps space. Uh, choose one whatever one you want. I, I'm, I've am i used Jenkins a lot. I don't really care for it. I'm using GitHub Actions a lot. I've used CircleCI a lot as well. Uh, I use GitHub Actions pretty much for everything that I do now. And understand, ask yourself as you're learning GitHub Actions, as an example, how does this fit into my GitOps slow? Right? That's where different branching strategies come into play. Uh, when do we want to execute certain pipelines and why? figuring out the purpose of each of these pli pipelines and where they fit in within the application delivery cycle, things like that. So that's gonna be critical. There's also tools in this space like Waypoint that help to bring it a level higher, uh, HashiCorp Waypoint that help to bring it a level higher beyond just the pipeline, but thinking about that entire application delivery cycle as a workflow in and of itself with pipelines baked in, right? Uh, infrastructure provisioning, yes. Yeah, you're gonna be doing a lot of that as a platform engineer for sure. Terraforming as big here, it's, it's just industry standard at this point. There are a lot of other ones and these other ones are good to know about for sure. But you do need to understand how to create infrastructure and I would look up and add to this immutable infrastructure principles, right? Because that's really what we end up talking about. We can end up doing a video on that because I know this video is already pretty long. So let's try and crank through some of this stuff. Configuration management, Yep, Ansible is good to learn. Chef Puppet. Uh, just my personal bias out of these three, I'd probably still lean Ansible if I'm going to just focus on pure config management. That's just myself. I've used Terraform and Ansible together hand in hand a lot of the time as I'm doing uh, provisioning and, and then doing a couple of things on the server that I need to do post provision to configure using Ansible for that, etc. Observability. Yeah, this is where understanding the performance of your resources comes into play, being able to do things like project how much a particular app may need capacity wise, having good observability is critical for that, then you get into things like monitoring and actually alerting based on certain red flags. Once you understand your performance, and making sure your logs are centralized in the right place like this is critical for platform engineering because it gives you the insight into how your platform is operating and all of the applications on that platform. All the tools here are good. If I was going to prioritize, Prometheus is still heavily used. Grafana, for sure, still heavily used. All of these are good. I'm not hating on tracing. I like Jaeger. All of them are fine and good. Um, logging. Yeah, I'm surprised you don't have like Splunk in here things like that, or another seam, or maybe a category for it for that. But this is fine. Elastic stack, Loki, I mean, okay, well, leave that be, that's fine. Uh, but just think about that. How do I observe my platform and all the apps running on it? How do I provide a service to my internal developers that they can use to deploy their applications? And I don't know how things are actually performing, all right? Chaos engineering, uh, yes, but it's not as important, honestly. It, it'll be important at specific places you go to. Right? It's not going to be, it's not like this is a huge thing that everyone is doing all the time, de facto thing. It is a thing. 
right? And learn about it as you go, but I would prioritize the other things. So policy, OPA, that's huge. Even there's like Sentinel with Terraform that you can use. Uh, OPA is a really big player now. I really like what they're doing for sure. You got other tools like uh, Paladin Cloud, things like that, uh, who are like open source policy, policy management type of things, which I think are really cool. Service mesh, yep. Uh, it's especially coming up, right? This is becoming especially relevant. I would add Kong in here actually too. Console, huge. Kong, I think is doing some cool stuff. Obviously I work at HashCorp, so I'm gonna be partial to console, but Istio, of course, you know, that's a lot of what's happening Kubernetes native. But for managing how not just your Kubernetes workloads interact, but how all of your workloads interact, because in companies, unfortunately, they don't have all their workloads in Kubernetes. They have they have to manage workloads across in different places that they're on uh, regular infrastructure that are on premise, et cetera. So that's where something like console would come into play where you want to manage the connectivity and, and kind of service discovery across all of those things. But understanding the differences, that's important, right? And then choose one to start. If you start with SEO, fine. If you start with console, fine. They both work. Console, in my opinion, gives you more flexibility for those other workloads. But either one, I'm not going to fault you for learning it, whichever one you want to do first. Uh, other supply chain security, okay. So Kubernetes security, yes. But that Kubernetes security should be as you go as well, right? You don't want to just ignore security up front and then focus on it specifically later. Just learn as you go. Ask those questions in your mind. Okay, I'm deploying this application. How? What's the secure way of deploying this application using Kubernetes? What are some things that I should think about as I'm doing my, as I'm building my container images, things like that, to bake in security? You don't have to do it all up front, but at least understand what you will have to do in the future, right? Uh, operators, Kubernetes operator, operator SDK, okay, and then. Credits to Siam down here, Kubernetes engineer specialization, excuse me, uh, Kubernetes on commute, node using container D. Okay, cool. Backup, Valero, GitOps, Flux, Argo, yeah, those are cool. Um, Observability, yeah, these are just kind of reiterations of what we've already talked about. This is great. I think that this roadmap is really solid, and I think that if you know, huge credits again to Vrash for coming up with this. I really appreciate him reaching out and, and he's already been helping a ton with the community. So I think that this is a great place to start. So go ahead, his handles are up here, right? So go ahead and follow him on Twitter. He's also trying to start his YouTube, so try and follow him there. And uh, leave a comment if you have a thought, a, a disagreement, whatever it is with the concepts or you'd like to enhance it in some way. Let's build this out as a community and help more people develop these skills around platform engineering as a whole. All right, well, that's it for the video. If you learned anything, please like and subscribe. I really appreciate you all watching. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Gerald out.